Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. Manager ordered me to sell tickets, so I refused to help her in the kitchen. The second story. Boss did not follow the safety regulations, therefore the HSE, Health and Safety Executive, paid a visit and found numerous risks and violations. The third story, I refused to follow the manager's order, and later he apologized to me. Today's first story is, you want me to abandon my position and do something else? You got it. I was listening to a story a couple of minutes ago about a manager at a retail store, and this triggers my memory a while ago at my very first job. I was around 16 male at that time, when I was being offered to work at a community center for two nights, making $70 a week. As a high schooler, $70 a week makes me feel like the richest kid in school, so I agreed. My main job is cafeteria assistant, from 5.30 to 9 p.m., and it's extremely relaxing most of the time. I just have to prep, cook very little, handle cashier stuff and help the main cook, which is around 80 female, so she does need a bit of physical assistance as well. It's not difficult by any means, and after a while I started to understand the pattern on when it's busy time, and when it's relaxing time. The reason they open the cafeteria around that time is during those hours, they open the gym floor for bingo night. There are staffs outside the cafeteria as well, who are selling bingo tickets, number caller, greeter, and the manager. At random times, when it's usually quiet in the cafeteria, my manager asked if I can help the floor by going around selling tickets and merchandise. Usually it was at reasonable times when I know I can leave my main cook to be on her own, so I never refused. Also, the customers sometimes gave me tips when their tickets are a winner, so that's good as well. One day when I came to one of my shifts, I suddenly felt like something was off. The hall is packed more than usual, even a few people are standing while playing bingo, because all the chairs and tables are occupied. By that time I know that the cafeteria is going to be busy, so I waste no more time and get to work on lots of prepping and boiling hot dogs. I was prepping extra because I'm anticipating the dinner rush. During the prepping time, my manager suddenly came to the cafeteria, and without hesitation, she told me to drop whatever I'm doing and go out to the floor to help her sell tickets. I told her that I just got here, and my plan to prep extra for the dinner rush, but she wouldn't budge. Even the words of the main chef falls on her deaf ears. She told me that I've prepped enough and to stop wasting time. Well, who am I to question a manager's decision, right? Cue malicious compliance. I happily obliged to her order took the tickets off her hands and off I go. Not a minute after I got off the floor, I saw the very first customer coming to the window of the cafeteria and I was immediately thinking, let the games begin. The customers versus manager, not the bingo. From the floor I can see into the inside of the cafeteria and my manager, who didn't get a chance to leave after telling me to go out, has to serve the customer because the main chef is taking over my duty to prep. However, like I mentioned earlier, the main chef is an 80 year old senior so her taking over my duty is almost impossible. Here's the list of my duty during prepping. Refilling condiments bottle from the heavy gallons. Refilling sugar from the big bag. Cutting vegetables for hot dog toppings. Carrying cases of water and sodas to be chilled in the fridge. Brewing coffee and tea. Boiling hot dogs. Stacking donuts. Handling transactions. Sweep and mop after closing. Here's the main chef's duty. Making hoagies and salads. Monitoring my tasks. I'm literally doing all of the heavy lifting because I'm physically capable. She's not. She's even having trouble handling transactions because her eyesight isn't good. It takes her a short while to determine certain dollar bills. Anyway, that one customer at the cafeteria becomes two. Then after a few seconds, my prediction was correct. After I made it down to the end of the gym floor, I turn back, and there's now a long line of customers in front of the cafeteria. I can't hear what's going on because the end of the gym floor is pretty far from the cafeteria but I can judge by the silhouette of my manager's body movement and the customer in front of her that things do not look good. I think my manager saw me looking at the cafeteria because she's clearly waving at me, assuming telling me to go back. We don't have microphone in the cafeteria. However, instead of walking back in line at the second column directly back to the cafeteria, I started walking to the furthest corner of the gym floor from the cafeteria, pretending to sell tickets, when all I'm doing is chatting with a player during the short break. The player was my favorite customer as well, and she did buy a few tickets from me. Right after I made the transaction, the bingo caller has started to make an announcement that they're going to start again in 30 seconds. I took a quick look at the cafeteria, and it looked chaotic. From the looks of the silhouette, it looks like my manager is having an argument with a couple of irate customers. 
Again, I'm just assuming that my manager isn't quick enough to get the order out before the game started. I was chilling there for about 25 seconds, watching the chaos unfold, before the bingo caller announced that he's going to start in 5 seconds. Immediately all of the customers in line have disbanded and goes to their original place, hungry and thirsty and still irate. I started walking again and I see that my manager has now disappeared from the cafeteria and started walking towards me at the floor, looking disheveled. Calmly I asked if everything is okay in there. She looked mad, but she knows better not to explode in front of all the players and just told me as calmly as she could to go back to the cafeteria. I tried poking the bear by asking her what to do with the tickets, because I still have some. She just snatched it off my hands aggressively along with the money, but from the shock of her aggression, I accidentally dropped everything to the floor. Imagine playing 52 catch, but with money and bingo tickets. Before I could offer my help to pick everything up, she just growled at me silently to just go. All right then. When I'm back, it was a mess. There are some water bottles and soda cans rolling on the floor. The main chef is sitting down on the chair looking exhausted. I really feel bad for her. Coffee pots are empty, condiments are smeared all over the table and so on. It's pure chaos. Luckily, I know the routine well enough to recover the situation. And at the next break, I was prepared well enough to handle the wave of customers, even the previously irate ones. The main chef has recovered enough too. Fortunately, most of the regulars already know me, so they're nice and patient with me. Instead to my manager who didn't know as much as me about the cafeteria. After the wave is over, I took the time to prep again for the next one, and suddenly my manager walked in. It looks like she calmed down just enough to compose herself to... approach me? Instead of walking away, she's coming at me? Ho ho! After seeing the state of recovery I just pulled, she asked why I didn't come back when the cafeteria was busy. I told her that I didn't know. I was too far, and she told me to sell tickets, so I assumed that I'm not allowed to come back until I sold everything. She didn't really have much to say after that, took a bottle of water and just left. The main chef and I just started laughing silently after the manager left. Never underestimate the pettiness of a teenager. Well, at least me when I was a teenager, haha. <laughs> the next story is, I'm not paying you for your injury, take it to court. Okay. Back when I was 20, I worked at a motorhome manufacturer. It was pretty small, with around 20 people in total. I had to go at all aspects of the job before settling on the joinery shop, where all the wood was cut by CNC machine, and either prep for the main workshop, or pre-assembled where possible. Part of the prep work involved putting rubber edging onto exposed edges of wood, and to do this you have to cut a groove into the edge for the edging to slot into. To put this groove in we used a handheld router with a slotting bit, but the router was mounted under a workbench with the bit sticking out of a hole. As it was a handmade piece of equipment, it didn't have any safeguards on it, so you can probably see where this is going. I was slotting a large piece of ply when my hand slipped off the top and into the blade. When I pulled away and looked, I realized the tip of my middle finger was hanging off from about three-fourths of the way down my nail, and my index and ring finger were badly cut too. I was alone in the joinery building, so had to go get help in a lift to the hospital. Went to the hospital where they managed to reattach my finger minus the bone, and took five weeks off work while I recovered. When I did return, it was with a plastic guard while the healing finished. About a week later when the owner and I were both in, I went to his office to talk. I had initially intended to just ask for my lost wages, which were about 1,200 pounds at the time. But as soon as I entered and asked, can we talk? I was immediately hit with, if you're coming to ask for money, you can forget it. Go see a solicitor. Not even a, how are you recovering? Are you okay? Etc. I tried to be rational, but he wasn't having any of it. So I did just that. Went to a no win, no fee lawyer. And after some back and forth was awarded 6,000 pounds. Beyond that though, the HSE, health and safety executive, paid a visit and found numerous risks and violations. Fire exits were blocked. First aid training was well out of date. Wires were run across the floor to permeate workstations with no trip protection, etc. The owner got a thorough telling off in order to bring the safety standards in line with recommendations. This obviously led to a bad atmosphere at work, so I started looking for another job, which was for the best, as the company went into administration. After a mix of paying people to undertake the required changes and the motorhome market taking a wobble, I was made redundant, but at least received redundancy pay from HMRC and walked into another job that following week. The owner declared bankruptcy, but reopened under a different company name and under someone else's name. His wife, I think. I'm kind of glad he kept going though, as apparently safety standards did change and a lot of people kept their jobs, with some redundant people returning after he built himself back up. The last story is, come see me in the morning. This happened quite some time ago, but I can remember it like it was yesterday. I work in a technical field with on-site visits to customer site being the norm at the time. 
One customer had been waiting quite some time for service, due to asbestos abatement, in the building blocking access to the basement where I needed to work. The customer was government, and the end user was an executive, so they insisted we do the work anyway. I was simply told to go to site and do the work with no preamble. I reasonably believed that the asbestos abatement was completed and all was good to go. Well, when I got to site, they told me that the area was still contaminated, and I would need to comply with their protection protocols. Once I learned that these protocols included stripping off all my clothes, showering, putting on an environmental containment suit complete with isolated air supply, I more than balked. I said hell no. I wasn't performing emergency work. I was adding a telephone line to a phone system for an executive that could wait as far as I was concerned. I had a beard at the time. Later while taking an H2S Alive course, I learned beards and masks don't mix, especially the ones used for these purposes. Next step was to inform my manager of the situation. To say my manager and I did not get along would be a severe understatement. Openly hostile on both sides would be closer to the truth. He simply couldn't fire me or he would have, I have no doubt. I was simply too good at my job. I on the other hand did not have a lot of opportunities to move elsewhere, as the knowledge and job was very specific. Anyway, this win is expected for me. M equals manager. Me equals me. Me. Hey, I can't do this job, as they're still removing asbestos. M. We know about the asbestos, but we made arrangements for access. Me. You didn't tell me anything. I walked into this blind. There's no way this is important enough for all the hoops I need to jump through. M. Do the job or get your A in my office in the morning. Me. I'm not doing it, so see you in the morning. I knew how the morning meeting would go. He'd have a letter for me to sign about refusing to work as the best case. Possibly he might actually follow through on past threats and let me go. As luck and convenience would have it, this particular building was home to the Department of Labor for my region. I strolled down to the fifth floor to talk to Occupational Health and Safety. I explained the situation to them, and they were very helpful. Not only did I have the right to refuse work under those conditions, I was obligated to refuse. Had I actually done the work and something went wrong, my company would have faced stiff fines and sanctions. They were very familiar with this specific scenario, as they themselves were in the same building. They provided me with all of the relevant statutes in documented form, highlighted relevant sections and drafted a letter to my manager by name, advising him of obligation to support my decision. I slept well that night. The next morning was interesting to say the least. There was a lot of back and forth, but I did not reveal my ace in the hole as I wanted him to hang himself. He wanted me to sign several pieces of paper, stating that I refused to do the work, that I put the company in a bad position, and that my employment with the company was subject to termination. I maliciously complied, took copies, and stored them away safely elsewhere. I then returned to his office and gave him the documents that were prepared the day before, with the biggest sh eating grin I can ever remember having. He did not take it well, claimed I set him up, threatened me the whole gamut. I told him I needed a written apology or I would take everything to corporate. He came through on the apology and I never went to corporate, but he also never gave me grief after that. I basically castrated his authority over me, and although it would be a stretch to say I enjoyed my remaining time at the company, that would not be accurate, but at least it was less bad. Subscribe, hit the like button, and have a nice day.